We are coming upon the surface of Sedna, one of the farthest objects in our solar system that is considered to be a dwarf planet. Now, what is Sedna and what is on its surface may be a mystery for us until at least several more decades. But in Space Engine, we can kind of try to recreate the surface based on the knowledge we have from other dwarf planets, such as, for example, Pluto, that we know a little bit more about. Now, what does Sedna look like? And is this what it actually looks like in real life? We will only know in the future. But if we look at this from a distance, you'll notice that it has a sort of a red-ish color, similar to Pluto and, of course, similar to Mars. So today we're going to try to terraform Sedna. We're going to talk about a little bit about it, about its history and about its properties and features. And also we're going to talk about the redness of this dwarf planet. Welcome to What the Math. And welcome to our solar system. In today's video, we're going to be trying to terraform Sedna. It might be actually a lot more difficult than it sounds because, well, first of all, where is it? It's so, so far away. And there it is. I actually finally found it. It is so far away that if I were to zoom out from here, and this is where Earth is, this is where... Um, this is where Jupiter is, this is where Saturn is, and let's see where Sedna is. Look at that, look at how far away it is from everywhere. And this is actually its periapsis, this is its lowest or closest um, part to, to the Sun. This is actually um, where it's the closest. The farthest part is way over here. Look at how far it is. This is ridiculous. So, in terms of the actual numbers, this periapsis right here is about 77 astronomical units away from the Sun. In other words, it's 77 times as far, the, far away from the Sun as the Earth. And this part right here, this is about almost a thousand astronomical units away. This is how far it is. What does this mean for Sedna? Well, it means that if you were to stand on its surface, if you were to actually zoom in here, and you would then to look at the sun, you would basically see a very, very tiny speck, bright speck, that is the sun. You would really not see very much because it's so far away. And what this all means is that we get almost no radiative power, almost no heat from the sun on this particular dwarf planet. And yes, Sedna is technically a dwarf planet, even though some people have not officially assigned it this title and unfortunately it's so dark that we can't even see its surface right now. This is how dark it is and this is how far away from the sun it is. So let's actually advance the time a little bit and we're going to see it orbit the sun. And uh, in uh, 20, uh, 2075 or 2075, uh, which is, I guess, uh, what, 60 years from now, uh, it will reach its periapsis. It will be the closest to the sun. So if NASA or any other space agency is able to launch a spacecraft to reach Sedna uh, in around, I don't know, 2033 or so, we'll be able to finally actually take some pictures, take some photos of it and get some more information about this interesting dwarf planet. So, uh, its orbit is really, really slow. It takes about 11,000, almost 12,000 years to orbit the sun just once. So, once it pa passes this periapsis right about now, this is the closest part to the orbit, this is where it gets the highest amount of sun as well, it will then start flying away from the sun, and it will... Uh, head towards its, its apoapsis, which is, like I said, about a thousand times uh, uh, the distance of Earth from the Sun. And because of all this, Sedna currently has the record for the longest orbit and also for possibly being the farthest object, at least currently, known to us. So there's no other object that is as far away and has as uh, an interesting um, orbital length as, as Sedna. And for this reason, it's actually kind of important to study because uh, it is a very large object. It's possibly about uh, something around 1,000 kilometers in diameter or 500 kilometers in radius. And uh, because it's so large, it, we have to try to understand its origins. Where did it come from? How did it get there? Uh, and because of its elliptical orbit, um, it suggests to scientists and I guess to us as well that maybe something else, something more massive caused this elliptical orbit and it couldn't have been Pluto, it, oh, sorry, not Pluto, but um, I guess Pluto, yes, it couldn't have been Pluto because Pluto is not massive enough. It couldn't have been Neptune because Neptune is too far away from it. And maybe, just maybe, there is something else very massive orbiting 
relatively far from the sun that caused all this. So for this reason, many scientists have actually proposed that there might be something else orbiting around our sun farther away, possibly an Earth-sized object, 1,000 astronomical units away, or possibly a Jupiter-sized object, 5,000 astronomical units away, or maybe, just maybe, it's even a brown dwarf, a very, very large um, gas giant that never really became a sun, but is so large and so massive that it causes all of these orbital per perturbations and all of these orbital changes in dwarf planets that are so distant, so distant from us. Unfortunately, we haven't found that yet. We know that there's nothing within 100 astronomical units of our um, planet because we've searched the skies and we found nothing. So maybe if there is one, it's going to be farther away. It's going to be something like something like over here at this particular orbit. So maybe there is one, and we'll talk about this in the next video because um, the name for this hypothetical dwarf, uh, not dwarf, sorry, uh, for this red um, brown dwarf is um, Nemesis. So there is actually astro astrophysicists out there that think there is something called Nemesis, which is possibly a brown dwarf orbiting our sun at a distance. But anyway, so let's, let's talk about Sedna. Let's talk more about Sedna. Let's try to terraform it. We might succeed, we might not. Let's figure this out. So, um, one thing about Sedna is that we cannot use sun as a heat source. It's just too far away. It's not going to provide us with enough heat, even if we have crazy amount of greenhouse effect. So that will not help us. But nevertheless, we can still give it some um, atmosphere. We can possibly, you know, throw a few rocks at it to warm it up, possibly detonate a few nuclear bombs to uh, make surface just a little bit warmer for a little bit, just so we can start releasing all of the methane, all of the... Um, uh, carbon gases and all of the water gases that are actually uh, or may be present on this dwarf planet. We know that this uh, particular dwarf planet is probably similar to Pluto, so it's probably made up out of water, methane, nitrogen, ices, and something called tholines, which is what you saw um, that gives it the red color. So let's see, if I were to look at Pluto right now, and here's Pluto right here, it's brownish reddish surface caused by something called tholines. Now these tholines are um, sort of the products of methane. When methane gets hit by solar radiation, specifically by um, ultraviolet light, it turns into something else called tholine, which is this brownish reddish material. It, it's only present in outer um, planets. It's not really present on Earth because we have atmosphere and we have um, other things protecting us from ultraviolet radiation. Uh, but on uh, pl planets like Pluto on, or even on um, uh, moons like uh, Triton, which I don't think we have here, but uh, we have it in the other simulation. Let me show you what it looks like. So we're going to go to Neptune here. This has its moons and its moon right here, Triton, is a very, very cold moon, but it's also sort of brownish in color. It has brownish red color because of tholines that we know exist on tri Triton as well. And this is all caused by the ultraviolet radiation hitting its surface and basically tr changing methane into these reddish brownish molecules. And so when we looked at Sedna, and unfortunately in this game for some reason it's sort of just brownish grayish ball right now. I think it's possibly a bug, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but it sort of looks like this. You can kind of see the surface here. It's actually a lot more red, a lot more brown. And in real life, it's probably one of the reddest objects in our solar system because of... Well, first of all, because it's so far away from the sun, so nothing really hits its surface. Nothing really disturbs its surface very often or possibly at all. So it might not even get any um, craters on the, on the surface because uh, it may have been undisturbed by meteorites and by um, comets hitting it. Uh, but we know that it's uh, it's sort of low in terms of albedo. Its albedo is only about 0.34 or 34%. And it's probably even more red than Mars. Now, Mars is red because of iron, but th uh, this particular um, dwarf planet is probably red because of tholines. And its surface is actually ridiculously cold. Um, it's so cold, as a matter of fact, that the reason why it was named Sedna is because Sedna is actually the Inuit goddess of the Arctic Ocean. Or specifically, it's the goddess that lives on the bottom of Arctic Ocean in the most coldest place on Earth. And because of that, um, the scientists decided to give, the, to give it the name Sedna. 
And it's so cold, in fact, that uh, the methane ice cycle that is present on other dwarf planets and other cold planets, where essentially methane becomes uh, gas and then it becomes snow again and it becomes gas, it becomes snow. Um, so this is actually something we've witnessed on Pluto very recently. So it might not even have that because it's so cold that methane just stays ice at all times. So to even release this initial methane or to release anything to, in, in order for us to make the atmosphere, we have to possibly cause some collisions on, it, on the surface of Sedna. So we're going to slow down time and launch a few asteroids at it. Because this is probably the only way we'll be able to warm up this uh, dwarf planet. Otherwise, it's going to stay cold forever. Uh, alternatively, we can obviously launch um, nuclear weapons. We can, you know, cause some more destruction on the surface uh, by basically launching things at it that things that explode, things that cause warmth and heat. And this will release some of the water, some of the methane, some of the other things that are currently in ice form on on the surface. And I also hope that uh, me smacking things into Sedna right now will also cause it to change its appearance towards uh, what it's supposed to look like, because right now it doesn't look like anything it should. And so here comes the asteroid number 9 and asteroid number 10. Alright, so this kind of warmed up the surface a little bit. It's now at almost 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling, close to boiling temperature of water when it's one atmospheric pressure. And look at that, we actually have clouds now, I think, because the planet, uh, dwarf planet is a little bit warmer. But that's not enough, unfortunately, so we're going to have to do something else. Because we want to maintain the heat, and we know that the sun is not going to provide us with enough warmth to maintain the greenhouse effect. So we have to figure something else out. And uh, I think really the only way for us to warm, out, uh, warm up this dwarf planet is uh, by making the heat from the inside. So we have to create some friction on the inside. And of course, to do that, we'll probably have to use some sort of a massive object orbiting around it. Now, in the future, maybe we'll be able to create some kind of a... Some kind of a gravitational mass hole thing that will orbit around uh, Sedna in order for it to receive as much tidal heating as possible. But in this game, we don't really know how to do that yet. So what we're going to do is, firstly, we're going to enable tidal heating right here, which will make it warm up if we place something massive around it. And then we're going to place something around it. So let's just say this is the future where we have invented this. A uh, way for us to create these uh, massive, tiny but massive black holes that we can launch around different planets that can then create friction, or in other words, tidal heating. And so here it is, this is called Sedna Heater. Um, it's just a tiny black hole that's only about 90% mass of Earth, and we're going to place it at just the right location for us to get tidal heating for Sedna. So this is going to be our source of heat, which will create friction from the inside and warm up the planet in the same way that the microwave warm, warms up our food, by basically making uh, molecules oscillate and rub against each other. And if you want to know how to add something like a black hole that is smaller than the actual black hole orbiting around the planet, this is how you can do it. So this is how I actually did it originally. I um, I basically paused the game and then took... Uh, I know that Venus works really well, so I took Venus and I placed it in an orbit around Sedna, somewhere right here, I guess. We can move this later if we need to. And then uh, go uh, click on Venus and go into its uh, statistics here lock the mass and then go into radius and type something really really tiny like I actually typed something like 10 zeros and then a one and this will turn it into a black hole automatically so here we go here is our black hole and we're going to name this Sedna heater and so now we have this Sedna heater orbiting around Sedna and as long as we have tidal heating which we actually do because you can see Sedna releasing some steam here, we will actually have really nice, hopefully warm temperature. I don't know if it's going to be too hot, maybe it might be actually too hot, but we'll wait a few years and see what it looks like. So the surface of Sedna currently looks like this, even though it's sort of bugged out in this particular uh, window, but you can see it here. So there's water, there's some oceans here, and uh, there's also clouds as well. We can also change the materials a little bit if we need to, uh, but you know what, we'll, we'll do this later, but basically here you go. So this is how you can try to terraform distant objects by essentially uh, placing um, a really tiny black hole that orbits around them, or in this sense actually Sedna is orbiting around this black hole, and this black hole is only about 66 times the size of the moon, or it's only about 81% uh, size of Earth, or mass of Earth. 
Anyway, so we've done that. We have the initial heat from the uh, asteroids and meteorites and comets. We have some water that's melted. We have gas that's been released now, so we can actually start adding atmosphere and creating atmosphere uh, that is uh, that will help us survive on this dwarf planet. And so after a few years, we get the atmosphere. It is now about one atmospheric pressure on the surface. It's still a little bit hot from all of these asteroid impacts, but this will cool down with, with time. So we're just going to advance time and... Uh, see what how this planet, how this dwarf planet transforms with the tidal heating it gets from our heater black hole and also when all of these impacts cool down as you can see they already some of them are cooling down already and what this dwarf planet looks like if we actually terraform it and if we have tidal heating um, effects from the black holes uh, orbiting around us. All right, excellent. So I think after a few years, we were able to reach stable atmosphere of about one atmospheric pressure. We're also able to reach a stable surface temperature of a relatively nice 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, this is a little bit colder than Earth, where it's uh, approximately 13 to 15 Celsius. But here you can see it's still kind of going up slowly. And all of this is, of course, a combination of the tidal heating we get from the black hole called Sedna Heater orbiting around us. But also at the same time, we have a little bit of greenhouse effect that um, basically keeps the heat inside the atmosphere. All of the heat that's generated by the um, tidal heating is kept inside because of the atmosphere and because of all of the uh, various greenhouse gases we have on our surface. Now, unfortunately, we don't really see any surface features on this uh, dwarf planet because for some unknown reason, um, the actual textures actually have bugged out. There's actually a bug in the alpha 16.2 of this game. But you can see what it looks like right here. You can actually kind of see there's, you know, there's uh, gray air surface rocks. There is uh, really nice oceans. And there's a lot of really nice looking bluish, purple-ish um, atmospheric features and also surface features as well. In other words, this is what it would look like if Sedna was possibly terraformed one day in the future. But how we do it is still a mystery because like I said, sun is too far away to give us enough heat. And if we actually create something like a Sedna heater, which is basically a Venus-sized, Venus mass, uh, that is, black hole that sort of heats up the uh, dwarf planet using tidal heating, if we can do that, we might as well create other uh, similar planets, similar dwarf planets closer to the sun. Why, why even bother terraforming Sedna that's so far away unless it's for some unknown reason that we actually decide to do it? In other words, terraforming Sedna is actually not particularly useful because it's just too far away. Uh, all in all, though, this is still kind of fun to do in the game. I think using a black hole was actually kind of an interesting way of doing this, and I'm glad it actually worked. Now, whether we actually do launch uh, a probe to Sedna in 2033, and if it lands in or at least visits Sedna in 2075, only future will tell, and hopefully we're all still alive to see it and possibly even get some video or picture footage from the surface of Sedna so we can actually see what it's really like on the surface and what it really looks like. Because so far all we know about it is that it is actually just really, really red. Now all of the redness will disappear as soon as you have atmosphere and pressure and as soon as there is some sort of atmosphere on the surface because all of this methane will melt and go uh, become basically atmospheric methane. So unfortunately it will not be as red anymore but it, will, it might look something like this, we never know. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video and if you did check out some of the other Universe Sandbox 2 videos that I've posted right here. And now that I have a way to terraform any object by basically essentially creating a black hole next to it and allowing it to heat up the insides of this particular object, we can pretty much terraform anything. We can even create Earth without the sun that sort of flies into space by itself and doesn't need the sun because we now have black holes and other objects to heat us up. You can do this in a game by basically doing what I did, creating Venus and uh, locking in mass and then changing its radius to 0 0.0000000001 and this will give you a black hole. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you enjoy space videos or if you want to learn more about math and science of space and other things. Thank you, game you later and bye bye.